It's been a long road for you, Marilyn. Uh, not just the last year, but really at uh, the last couple months have been uh, really difficult. Uh, I remember just talking with Marilyn on the phone. When I couldn't come, I would call her. I was a pest. I would call her all the time and just keep giving her scriptures and telling her it's going to be okay and, and uh, trying to encourage her and encourage Gil. And we didn't think that we would be here today at his memorial service. When uh, Marilyn called me to uh, tell me that he had fallen and broken his hip and that he had had an accident uh, and was in the hospital, I mean, who would have thunk that we would, uh, two months later, uh, see him go home to be with the Lord? One of the things that I've talked with Marilyn about and and prayed for Marilyn for is that death is not an accident. Gil breaking his hip was an accident, but his death was not an accident. His death was an appointment. This is what the Bible describes death as. The writer of Hebrews wrote in 927, it is appointed unto men once to die. It's an appointment with death, if you will. Gil's death didn't take God by surprise. Uh, it was foreknown by God who knows all, who knows the end from the beginning. The psalmist in 139 verse 16 says, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. In other words, God knows all the days of our lives. He knows the day of our birth. He knows the day of our death. And he knows all the days in between, even before we are born. Because God knows all. He is omniscient. And he knows the end from the beginning. There's a psalm that's often quoted at memorial services. It's found in the 116th Psalm in the 15th verse, and it goes like this. I'm sure you've probably heard it. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, at first glance, that seems real, you know, apropos to quote at a memorial service, but Upon further examination, it almost sounds like God's anxious for people to die. And that's not the case at all. It doesn't mean that God was anxious for Gil's death. Rather, it means that God took serious Gil's death. Like Gil, every single one of us here today at his memorial service have an appointment, and it is an appointment with death. Why? Because God takes it very seriously. Death is serious. Uh, the reason is simply this. In the sight of the Lord, if a saint, a believer, one who was born again of the Spirit of God, dies, the Apostle Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's a celebration in heaven, as it were. As Marilyn shared, I you know, looked down at Gil. They had really officially pronounced his death, and she looked at me and asked me, he's, he's not here, is he? No, he's not here. This is just his body. He is absent from his body, and he is present with the Lord. Now, <laughs> that might seem a little bit unfair to have an appointment that you never scheduled. And it happens to be a pretty serious appointment and one that you're going to keep whether you like it or not. And it happens to be an appointment with death. Why does God take death so seriously? And why is the death of his saints precious in his sight? Solomon in Ecclesiastes wrote chapter 7 verses 1 through 4 the following. The day of death is better than the day of birth. 
It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. In other words, it is better to mourn at a memorial service than feast at your company Christmas party. Why is that? Well, clearly God doesn't want us to ever have any fun. Please don't believe that because nothing could be further from the truth. God's not this killjoy in heaven, never wanting us to experience joy in a morbid sort of way, saying it's better for you to mourn than to party. It's better to go to a memorial service like this than it is to go in and feast. Well, there's a reason for that. You see, today, we have been faced with the reality of death. And it is something that we will all face absent the return of Jesus Christ for his church in the event the Bible calls the rapture. In other words, every single one of you here today, should the Lord tarry, will likely have a memorial service. Now, why would God say that it's better to go to a memorial service than to a party? It's because when we're at a memorial service, we take to heart our brief lives in this world. Life is short compared to eternity. And you see, God never created us for this life. He created us for eternity. When you're at a memorial service, it's a time of introspection. It's a time to take the reality of our own death to heart. God takes it very seriously because of the eternal ramifications. You see, we're all going to spend eternity someplace. And by the way, there's no in between. I mean, no disrespect to religions that teach that there is, but the Bible does not teach that. The Bible simply, clearly, and specifically, and even explicitly teaches that we will either spend eternity in heaven or we will spend eternity in hell. That's pretty serious. The stakes are pretty high. We're not talking about just a matter of life and death. We're talking about eternal life and eternal death. Well, about right now, you're probably wondering. I mean, here you come to Gill's memorial service, and the pastor gets up here, and Marilyn just got done telling you how much she loves me, and I just, you know, I love her too, and... I don't think you love me right now because, you know, but I have to tell you the truth in love, but I have to speak the truth to you. And this is what Gil would want me to do. Whenever I do a memorial service, I always petition the throne of God and I say, God, you know, every memorial service is different. I did my own daughter's memorial service back in 2006. Of course, that was the hardest memorial service I've ever done. Your own child. But I always seek the Lord and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to say? And what is it that the one who is with you now, provided they knew you, what, what would they want me to say? And without exception, they would want me to say to you, not just what I have said to you, but what I am about to say to you. You see, it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, and then the judgment. 
Well, that's, that's really harsh, Pastor. Why would you say that to us? Well, because it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Why does there have to be death? Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. In other words, when sin entered the world, so too did death enter the world. Please know that death was never part of God's original plan. He created Adam and Eve in perfection and placed them in the garden. But when they disobeyed God and they sinned against God, when they sinned, death entered the world. You might be sitting here thinking, you know, I'm, I'm actually a pretty good person. And I'm going to go to heaven too and I'll see Gil again. Well, I don't want to judge your heart. Maybe you are a good person, but I need to tell you that you're not good enough. So, well, I, I've never murdered anybody. I've never done horrible, evil things like, you know, some people. Well, Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, every single one of us here today are sinners. Gil was a sinner. The nerve of your pastor, Marilyn, to say that about Gil. See, we're all born sinners. And that's why we need to be born again. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. You and I will never see Gil again in heaven, absent coming to the place where we acknowledge that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know what the wage is, the payment is, the penalty is? Well, it's the death penalty. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, there's a payment, there's a penalty for our sin, but there's the gift that comes because there is one who came and paid the penalty for our sin, who went to the cross and was put to death, was sentenced to death, was given the death penalty, and he took upon him your sin, my sin, Gil's sin, so that we could have the gift, which is eternal life. It's really childlike simple. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, as Jesus said, there is no way to the Father except through me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say, I am a way, a truth, and a life. There's only one who was perfect, who was sinless, and his name is Jesus. And there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved, the Bible says. Muhammad did not die for me. He did not die for guilt. He did not die for you. Buddha, he did not die for you. He did not die for Gil. There's no way to the Father except through him. He's the only way. Why? Because he's the only one. 
He's the only one that took upon him our death penalty. So it'd be like you're in a court and the judge says to you, how do you plead? You say, well, I'm a, I'm a good person. Not guilty. So the judge then proceeds to show a DVD of your life. You don't want him showing a DVD of your life. I know I don't want him showing one of mine. Conversely, you say, I'm guilty as charged. Now the judge is going to sentence you. Well, he's going to sentence you to death because the wages of sin, the penalty for your crime, is the death penalty. Enter Jesus. He says, I will go to the death chamber. I will go to the electric chair. I will go to the cross. I will go to my death in your stead. And I will pay your death penalty for you. And you can go free. The Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I think Maryland, for me, perhaps one of the best times in Israel was when you and Gil walked out into that cold, cold water to be baptized. And you remember what I asked you? Do you know what this means? See, to be baptized, you go down into the water, a symbol of death. But that's not how it ends. When you come up out of the water, it's a symbol of defeating death, rising again from death, as Jesus did. He went to the cross and he went to the tomb, but he came out of that tomb three days later and rose again and defeated death and overcame death because he paid the death penalty. Marilyn really made a, a beautiful plea. If there's anything that you could do for her, and even for Gil for that matter, it would be to believe on Jesus Christ and accept his payment for you as your Lord and Savior. Because I can assure you on the authority of God's word, when you're standing before God and he asks you, how do you plead? If you say not guilty and you try to enter into heaven, on your own merit and your own righteousness and your own good deeds, you'll never see Gil again. You'll never enter heaven. The only answer you and I and Gil can give is I accepted Jesus Christ's payment for me in my stead, and I have been pronounced not guilty. I can only imagine early that Friday morning when Gil breathed his last breath here and his first breath in the presence of the Lord. Oh, how he <laughs> joy because he had accepted Christ. How do I accept Christ? You know, the problem is it's too simple. We think we have to do something. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. 
I can assure you, Gil never stood before the Lord prior to entering in saying, oh, you know, I was, I was a good guy. Ask Marilyn. <laughs> No, he was there because he had received the gift freely that cost Jesus everything. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, gives us the answer as to what it is that we must do. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might, not the jury is still out. No, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Romans 10 verse 13 is perhaps one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. It says... All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, all means all. All. All of you. Any of you. That's all you have to do. Is call on the name of the Lord. Believe in your heart. Profess with your mouth and you will be saved. You know what happens at that very moment? The Holy Spirit indwells you. You see, there's a misnomer. We think that Christianity is a religion. It's not. It's a relationship. See, religion is what man does for God. Islam is a religion. Those terrorists on 9-11 were trying to earn their way to paradise. So in order to do that, they had to become martyrs and murderers and fly those planes into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. In other words, that's what they had to do to enter paradise. That's Islam. That's not Christianity. See, Christianity is not what man does for God. It's what God has already done for man. He became a man. Flesh incarnate. That's about what we're uh, about to celebrate during the Christmas season. The birth of the Savior. Emmanuel. God with us. God became one of us. So he could die for us. Because he wants a relationship with us. Not a religion. Then there's nothing we have to do. He's already done it. All. For all who will call. Is that you here today? That may be why you're here today. I want to give you that opportunity today. Now, we're not going to do any, and I know it's a little warm in here. I know how hard those pews can get. Of course, I'm standing, you're sitting, so bless your hearts. But just real quickly, where you're sitting right now, I don't need to see your hands because God sees your heart. And in a moment, we're going to pray. And I'm going to lead us in prayer, and as I'm praying, I want you to talk to him as a child to your heavenly Father who loves you so much, loves you so much that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I want to take a step further. If you will accept him, then I want you to tell Marilyn. Because I'll tell you something, that will be the one thing that you can do that would bless her during this time of grieving. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your only begotten son. 
Thank you for providing for us a way to you. Jesus, thank you for willingly going to that cross almost 2,000 years ago and taking all of our sin upon yourself and paying for it in full so that we could have eternal life with you. Lord, we can't thank you enough that Gil had made that decision and accepted you and now is with you. Lord, now we're here. We're gathered here today, friends, family, loved ones. And perhaps this is the time and there is no more time. And there are those who would like to today surrender to you and receive from you the free gift of eternal life. I'm just going to remain silent for a moment and I want to give you an opportunity just in the quietness of where you're sitting to pray. It can be a simple prayer as, Lord, I believe what Marilyn's pastor is saying and I, I want what Gil has now and I want to accept your payment for my sin that I might have eternal life. Doesn't matter how you say it, it's just that you say it. Will you? Lord, thank you. Thank you for Gil's life. Thank you for eternal life. And thank you for anyone today that has passed from death unto life. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we're going to have Polly come up for special music.